afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. You have uh, joined the BUILD Initiative's Child Welfare and Early Childhood Cross-Systems Collaboration to Improve Outcomes for Young Children and Their Families webinar. This is the first webinar of a series that we will be doing on the topic of collaboration between child welfare and early childhood systems on behalf of our youngest children. This is the kickoff webinar and we are really excited about the entire series. We're um, happy to partner with um, the NCIT, the National Collaborative for Infants and Toddlers, which is also supported by BUILD um, to produce this series, which will run through May. So we invite you to uh, join us for um, as many sessions as you would choose to. And uh, we're very happy that you're here with us today. We have a lot of information for you today and um, a lot of people that have uh, decided to join us for which we are really uh, very grateful and excited. Um, because of the number of people that we have, which right now is 276, <laughs> very exciting, um, we won't be able to have you ask your questions verbally um, out loud. We're going to ask you to put your questions in the chat. We have... Um, a wonderful person, Jonathan Chapman, who is monitoring the chat for us and will pass the questions along to us so that we can um, answer them um, during the, the Q&A portion of our webinar today. Um, just a couple of things beside the chat. We want uh, you to know also that this is being recorded and the recording will be available to you after the um, session is complete. We have a resource page and Jonathan put the link to the resource page in the chat already so that you can connect with that. We have some really um, wonderful resources provided um, by all of our um, presenters today, as well as some additional ones from previous research. So that's a wealth of information there. And then at the end, we will have an evaluation uh, set of questions that will pop up. We really hope that you will take the time to um, answer those questions. We'll also follow up uh, with an email to everyone uh, who attended um, with those questions. This helps us to understand what you're interested in and how well we did in um, what we intended to put on for you today. So we can move on ahead and uh, start. Um, the objectives of the whole series here are to raise awareness about young children and their families encountering or involved with the child welfare system. Um, we want to educate participants about the racial disparities in family separation from child welfare involvement. We want to promote opportunities and strategies for prevention for families and communities and provide examples of cross systems collaboration on behalf of our youngest children. So those are the things we want to do with the whole series. We really are both about the business of educating and raising awareness and also about the business of answering the question of what are we gonna do about it? We can move the slide. The objectives of this particular session are really to provide a rationale um, for why we need these two systems to work together, why the early childhood system um, is very much a system that's needed, a system of services needed by the youngest children in the child welfare system. And to bring a, um, awareness to everybody about the significant racial disparities um, for Black, Latino, and Native American children in the child welfare systems. Okay, we'll move. So these are our presenters today, wonderful, um, brilliant group of women as we happen to have all women today. I'm going to just briefly just call their names and then ask them to just say a little, um, about 30 seconds about who you are and what your work is. So the first is Dr. Ray. Oh, thank you. I'm a distinguished fellow at the BUILD Initiative and a um, professor emeritus of child development at Erickson Institute in Chicago. And I help lead at Bill the Equity Leaders Action Network, among other work. So I'm very happy to be here and to work with all of you today. Thank you, Dr. Ray. And we have Dr. Renee Boothroyd. Renee? 
Thanks for everyone for being here and all the chat. I feel so welcome for this morning or this afternoon, actually. Um, my name is Renee Boothroyd. I am an implementation specialist here at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I'm with the Frank Porter Graham or the FPG Top Child Development Institute. And in the past, gosh, it'll be 10 years um, in June, I will have been working in particular on one big project with the California child welfare system um, and especially their efforts to incorporate a practice model in their system and to really enhance the roles that leaders play in this work to transform their system and address institutional racism. So thanks. Thank you. And we have from Minnesota, Yvonne Goodsky. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're nice and warm. Where you're at, it feels like 10 below here in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> typical January day for us, but I would just want to say welcome. Uh, I want to say Anin Anishinaabeg Du, Jamanukwain Dijnakaz, Megazine and Dudame. I shared with you that my English name is Yvonne Goodsky. My uh, spirit name is Southern Spirit Woman, and I come from the Lakutere Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. Uh, I work at DHS where I have been for about seven years. Um, been in the role of Deputy Director for about eight months, so I'm in a strong learning curve right now. Um, prior to that, I worked alongside my colleague here, Rihanna Jacobs, in the Indian Child Welfare uh, Unit, and, and it's from that perspective that I'm here uh, sharing with you today. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. And Rihanna? Good afternoon. Uh, Rihanna Jacobs here. I'm a member with the Lower Sioux Indian Community of Minnesota. And like Yvonne said, I, I work in the Indian Child Welfare Act here um, at DHS at Minnesota. I'm the ICWA supervisor and uh, my main focus uh, with the Indian Child Welfare Act is really about compliance and those equitable outcomes um, through the Indian Child Welfare Act. Thank you so much. Thanks to all our panelists for joining us. And uh, as I said, I am Dr. Cynthia Tate. I'm with the BUILD Initiative. I am formerly the um, executive director of the Illinois Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development and senior administrator in Illinois' um, Department of Children and Family Services. So let's move the slide. So here's the big question. Why should we talk about child welfare involved families in an early childhood context? And so the reasons are very clear and there are many and uh, Dr. Ray is going to um, really get into this question a little bit more. But just to start us off, we know that separation from families really negatively affects young children's abilities to form close and secure interpersonal attachment relationships. And then we have all the brain science that we know and it tells us that 85% of the children's brain architecture is established by age three. So we know that these first three years of life are critical. We can move the slide. So the question also is, what does the data tell us about young children in the child welfare system? Uh, it tells us that about 40% of the children who are confirmed by CPS agencies as being victims of child mal maltreatment are ages zero to four. That's 40% in the early childhood years. Um, that's a big number. The infants and toddlers are removed from their homes at a rate more than double that of children who are age four to 17. There were 30,687 infants under the age of one in foster care in 2019. And there are 145,000 children between one and five. So I, I give you these numbers because some, you know, sometimes we might not really have a a really good idea of the volume that we're talking about, the number of children that are separated from their families before the age of five and that are in the system. And then we also know that children of color are disproportionately in the child welfare system, in foster care. And so let me just say for folks who may not um, be used to this word disproportionality, what that word actually means. Uh, disproportionality means where there is a higher percentage of children in a particular group found in the child welfare system than in the general population. So it's a percentage that is, is a relative percentage compared to uh, the number of children in the population. And so we have here, you know, a breakdown of Latino children, um, American Indian and Alaska 
native, which comes together in the data as one um, category, um, black and African-American children, and then white and non-Hispanic children. So um, what I want you to notice here is that for um, American Indian and native, uh, Alaskan native children, uh, their representation in child welfare, the number is small, 2%, but double their percentage in the population. So this is why it's important to pay attention to disproportionality, right? Because if you just look at the absolute number, you're not gonna get the full picture. Again, looking at black African-American children, um, they represent 23% of the um, children in child welfare, but only 14% of the children in the general population. So again, we're almost double. Um, and so this is what we want to um, really also focus on is what do we do about um, all this disproportionality of young children? And this data is for children five and under. Um, okay, so um, that's the background uh, that we wanted you to have. I'm going to ask Dr. Ray to um, go on and uh, go into your presentation for us, Dr. Ray. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tate. Um, welcome to everyone. I'm very pleased to see all of these people signing in from all over the country. This is very exciting and glad to be here with you. I want to start by just looking at the, for us to all look at this photograph. This is a demonstration that took place around the rights of children who have been in child welfare and the need for, um, and you can see a lot of the kids in the photo are young. They're demonstrating for um, uh, reminding us to remember that we have promises we've made to our children. And one of the key promises we've made is to keep them safe in this society, to help them grow up healthy and straight and strong, and to help them understand um, that the society basically cares about them. And some of the things I'm gonna talk about in the next 15 minutes really raise questions about how well we are in fact keeping our promises to our children. Next slide. One of the um, important things for us to keep in mind, which is pretty hard to forget because we're all living through this, is we're living in a really extraordinary historic period in which the critical fault lines in the society have been exposed. These fault lines already existed, the inequalities around race, ethnicity, social class, sexual orientation, gender, and other forms of oppression and exclusion but they have really been highlighted by the pandemic. We already have um, 800,000 Americans who have died from this during the pandemic, millions of people who are infected. The inf it, now researchers are saying, we're going to be living with this, these viruses for the remainder of our days. Um, we also have disproportionality as, as Cynthia mentioned about child welfare, but deep disproportionality in terms of who is dying. And most of those people who are dying, or disproportionately the deaths are among people of color, Blacks, uh, American Indians and Latinx in particular. Also those deaths, uh, disproportionalities are reflected in the children who are dying also from the, this pandemic. There's also a deep economic depression in the country, which has been exacerbated in communities of color. And there has been widespread social unrest and economic justice movements that have been, that have emerged in part because of violence uh, towards uh, black, brown, American Indian men, women, and children at the hands of the police and others but also because I think of the, these deep, the legacy of these deep inequalities. So we are living at a very difficult time and child welfare and early learning have both been, been negatively impacted by this reality. We have in, child, in early childhood care and education, a workforce that has disappeared because it has historically been exploited by in low wages, these particularly black women of color, black, brown and Native American and immigrant, uh, but also in child welfare, there's been a, a deep crisis around um, the workforce as well. So we need to, I think, always bear in mind the context, the complexity of the context in which our discussion today and going forward in the series has to be uh, grounded. Next slide. <clears throat> Because of those deep inequalities, there has been 
fairly consistently over the last decade, a stronger and stronger calls for focusing on racial and economic justice and racial and economic equity. That is driving resources towards those children, families, and communities who currently or historically have experienced marginalization, oppression, genocide, colonization, and other uh, forms of inequality, and to make sure that they are not further disadvantaged, um, but in fact are able to develop um, fully to thrive and to succeed within the society. So the challenge for us, particularly for children prenatal to three or prenatal to five, is really to create for every American Indian, Alaska Native, Black, Latinx, Asian, Amer Asian Pacific Islander family and young child between those ages um, to make sure that those who are marginalized are able to receive those supports that they need, that those uh, resources, rewards, and burdens are fairly distributed across groups and communities so that those with the greatest challenges are adequately supported and not further disadvantaged, and to make sure that policies and systems are designed to, port, to support families and children and that they are fair and just. Next slide. But the reality, again, which I was going back to thinking about the sort of conditions, the ecology in which we are, are living at this point, there are these deep systemic challenges, both in child welfare and in early care and learning in terms of serving the most marginalized families and children. There are at least four of these. One is the cultural disconnect. That is most of these systems, both early care and learning and child welfare do not, are not based and grounded in the communities that they are serving in terms of culture, language, values, beliefs, the roles of adults in relation to children and so on and so forth. All of these things that we think of as cultural are not really part of the way these systems generally function. There are always exceptions. There are always outstanding people who do great work despite the systems, but the systems are really grounded in a Eurocentric set of values and a Eurocentric history in an attempt to control particularly communities and uh, communities of color that were seen as problematic early on in the history, were seen as racially inferior, to some extent still are seen that way, and certainly as culturally inferior. And this was particularly true in terms of indigenous communities and in terms of African-American communities. Long, long history of this going back to the first context between um, Europeans with indigenous people and with Europeans with Africans who were brought to the United States. The second challenge is equity, which I've mentioned earlier. Um, so I won't repeat what I said, but simply that these systems are not equitable. They are not by and large driven by equity, values or beliefs or practices. This movement towards equity has just begun. It will take a much longer time. The systems continue to disproportionately disadvantage those communities and individuals and children that historically have been disadvantaged. It, the systems are also uh, in desperate need of reform or are completely broken, depending on your point of view. Some people, and I hope we get into this discussion through this webinar series, do we need to abandon these systems and rebuild them from the ground up? And if so, what would that take and what would it look like? Or can they be reformed? And if so, what would that take? And the fourth item that is a challenge for these systems is money. That when you look at the relationship between, for example, the US military budget and the budget for early childhood services, there, the relationship is deplorable. We clearly are not placing our, putting our values where, we, where our lip service is. We say we value children and we say we want children to do well and every child has an American birthright and so on and so forth. But when we actually fund these systems, the funding is fragmented, it is low, and these are what I'm gonna call a little bit later, systems of scarcity. And until they are not systems of scarcity, they are going to have a difficult time really meeting the needs of children and families. Next slide. 
Child welfare and early care and learning systems have common challenges, some of those which I just mentioned, but at the more granular level, there are not enough high quality programs, professionals, there's not enough availability of programs or accountability within those programs, and there's not enough access for Black, Indigenous, and others who are in poverty, poverty and most vulnerable within the society. Uh, people are seriously underpaid within these systems, and that is a really a crisis at the point of service delivery. This is particularly a problem. Uh, most children in poverty and children of color are not in high quality early childhood programs in the United States. And they and their parents do not receive comprehensive early childhood supports. That's, that is a simply a failing of, the, of, again, of these systems of scarcity. And again, they are, have limited funding. Next slide, please. The implications of those, of that kind of environment uh, that these systems operate in uh, run, runs directly against what we know from early childhood science. And when I say early childhood science, I want to make clear what I, I am not talking, using this phrase in the way that it generally is used to refer to um, studies that 100% of studies come out of universities uh, directed by university scholars. I am both including those kinds of studies, but I'm also talking about the science and knowledge and wisdom that comes directly from communi communities about the welfare, child rearing, and goals they have for their children to grow to adulthood and be successful within their society. So we, are, we need to really think about early childhood science as grounded both deeply in communities. And these are communities we tend not to, who have been presented to us as having no significant knowledge about child development and who have been seen as people who need to be changed to adopt attitudes and beliefs and behaviors around child development that reflect a Eurocentric perspective. So I think it's very important for us to think in a complex way about what is the knowledge that we are talking about here. But we understand from one aspect of early childhood science that all children develop neurologically. They all have brains and their brains are built by the experiences they have with directly with caregivers and with their environment in their immediate environment. This is particularly salient between birth and age five, where as, as uh, Cynthia pointed out, the majority of brain development occurs. Um, the neurologic development can be derailed by, uh, affected by adversity experienced by young children, by trauma, and by the buildup of toxic stress within children's bodies and within the bodies of adults. And that can make, um, that can really derail uh, the, the kind of neurological development we wanna see in all children. Um, the interactions that children have with others in their environment are important, that family members themselves need to be emotionally able and capable of engaging with children in productive ways. Um, we know that that is not always the case, and that is why it's important to have to consider how early childhood education programs and services and how child welfare can support families. But again, it has to be done through the, both the lens of what communities deem necessary and what systems can in fact deliver that does not harm children but supports them. Next slide. So we have um, both this issue of adversity and early learning. We know that at least one, there's one consistent, stable relationship that a child needs to have with an adult caregiver. And that relationship has to be over time. It has to have a, a, a degree of warmth and responsiveness. It has to support the child within the cultural framework the child is being raised. If that doesn't happen, the implication for child-serving systems are very clear. 
one of the things that happens with the system is that it often removes the child from the family, places children into multiple foster care placements without being able to guarantee that this, these settings or the setting that the child goes to is going to be able to consistently provide the kind of support the child needs. So the question of whether or not uh, child welfare systems, for example, can consistently provide the kind of support children birth to three and birth to five must have if they've experienced adversity or trauma is unclear. Um, so my colleague is telling me I have one minute. Okay, so I'm going to go forward here and make one other point that these systems, um, we have to, one of the problems with what we are experiencing with families is they often have the same level of toxic stress that children have when they interact with child welfare systems. That has to be a part of the equation. The next slide. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to go past this, keep going. So one of the critical issues I think we have to figure out is this question of harm or welfare, of support or regulation of families. For young children, early, early learning systems can harm children because they also provide inadequate care that doesn't meet the standards of early childhood science or of the communities that children come from in terms of how parents see high quality and the child, pardon me, child welfare systems duplicate that as well. Next slide. And I'll just I'll keep going. Uh, okay, so in order to succeed with this, we have to make sure that we have strong leadership. We have alignment and coordination, especially around equity and, and evidence-based models that we don't do anything without the input of families and communities that we compensate the workforce. We really are able to support the professional development of both child welfare and early learning staff and ad address the systemic inequalities that families experience. And I will stop. Thank, sorry, I apologize to my colleagues if I went over. You were perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> Thank you so much. There is so much in there. I know that people are going to have questions. So we want to encourage you, put your questions in the chat as they come up. Uh, you know, come up for you. Um, before we move on to uh, our next two presenters, we're going to just put up a poll for you. We'd like to know who's in our audience, just briefly, um, relative to your familiarity with um, both um, early childhood and child welfare. So if you would just uh, check off the answers uh, for these little questions. There's not too many of them. I think there's really only three here. And then um, we'll show the results of the poll, yeah, only three, and uh, share that with you and then we'll move right on. Okay, Jonathan, do we have um, enough results from our poll to share? All right, great. So about 75% of our audience is ch uh, early childhood, which is what we were um, expecting, but we are very happy uh, to also to have a 7% of folks from child welfare, 12% uh, from other um, uh, sectors, and people are putting those in the chat. We have a number of people from home visiting and early childhood mental health um, and who have put their um, information in the chat. 
And then um, when we look at how well you understand the child welfare system in your state, um, folks are pretty much in the middle. Maybe mostly everybody is around, you know, I understand it somewhat, um, but we do have 30 percent who say they understand a lot and uh, we've got four percent of you that are experts so awesome welcome so this this is who uh, we have in the audience we're now at 438 people so we're so happy that you're here so i want to move on and introduce now uh rihanna jacobs and yvonne goodsky from minnesota rihanna yvonne you could take yourselves off mute. Yes, you absolutely. All I'd right. like to say greetings. Can you hear me? We can. Good. I'd like to say greetings again from Minnesota. Uh, the tundra, <laughs> it's a cold area of the nation right now. Um, and I'd like to just welcome you here uh, with us, Rihanna and I. Um, you know, just really have a brief amount of time with you. We're going to be touching on some key concepts. We hope that it'll spark an interest and that you will... Um, take it upon yourselves to get some further education on these issues. Next slide, please. To start us off, we just really want to talk about the crisis state of our children that are in our system. Um, this goes in deeper to the statistics that were provided earlier by Cynthia. You can see that American Indian children are 4.7 times more likely to be involved in child maltreatment assessments or investigations than white children in Minnesota. American Indians are 16.8 times more likely to be in out-of-home placement. Those are staggering statistics. And they haven't moved much since 30 years ago. Um, really want to point that out. Um, nearly 11% of our American Indian children have experienced out-of-home care in 2019 compared with 1% of white children. This next slide here, this was some information that was shared with us just last year and really set the tone for us about, again, the type of situation that our youngest children, our sacred beings are in. Um, children under the age of three who entered out of home care were disproportionately likely to identify as American Indian. And this next one, this one, really is one that I ponder on and think about daily in my work. That almost 10% of American Indian infants in Minnesota are removed from the home by the age of one. That is, is staggering. Um, that means our babies, our most precious uh, resources are re being removed from home. Those, those folks that they have those stable relationships with, the folks, um, where you know, they feel that safety. Um, and uh, you know, again, thinking back to the previous presenter, how this trauma, essentially, the trauma that our children are facing as a result of this, it affects their development. It, de it affects their life um, and that can't go understated. So we just really wanted to start out our um, you know, sort of time with you by raising these, uh, the, these data points, talking about the, uh, the, the very hard situation that our children are faced with every single day. And at the state of Minnesota, you know, we're doing work with tribal nations to try and reverse this. And um, the tribal nations have, have the answers. They want to work on uh, prevention. They want to work on flipping the system, putting uh, resources into the front end of uh, services so that out of home placement is not needed. And I think we need to open our, our eyes and our hearts to those type of solutions. So at this point, uh, we'll go to the next slide and Brianna will, will give us some uh, information. Yeah, thanks Yvonne. So I think when we talk about this data, we really need to talk about historical impacts. Um, our previous presenter touched a little bit on that, you know, with socioeconomic, with um, federal policies, um, how they've impacted communities of color. And for the American Indian children, um, since the 1600s, um, you know, federal policies, the formation of the government have impacted children, Indian children, from um, treaties, uh, assimilation, 
which is where you'll see the boarding school error stem from, you know, our reorganization error, the termination of Indians. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 1960s, which is very recent, um, really a movement in self-determination, which is that American Indian movement. And I just have to put a shout out to one of our, um, you know, big movement. We've just, he's just passed, uh, Clyde Belcourt, who was a part of AIM. He was a part of that American Indian movement. And so that was a huge loss to our Indian community. Mm -hmm. So I just want to recognize that. So, um, yeah, a lot of errors that have impacted historically American Indian children and continue to impact. And um, the boarding error, you know, ended in the 1980s. And so that's, you know, my parents, my grandparents, um, as well as myself. So um, I think that we have to um, really recognize and honor that that generational historical trauma, it continues on and has moved into the child welfare kind of error, which is what we're in now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in 1978, the Indian Child Welfare Act was enacted and the intent behind the Indian Child Welfare Act was to preserve Indian families and their identity the argument through our, you know, our predecessors in the Indian community is that there is no vital resource more important to the continuation of a tribe than their children and their children's children. And so this is why um, ICWA was enacted. And so here in Minnesota, to further support that um, in the 1980s, we have the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, which is called MIFPA. And it really embeds ICWA throughout the state law, but it strengthens ICWA. So ICWA really um, impacts families that come into the system that go, you know, when children go into out of home placement. But MIFPA is really about that preventive piece. It's really a around how social service agencies work with tribes prior to that removal. And so um, the intent behind the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act was to support that preservation and for Indian um, tribes and Indian families to have a say um, in how and where their children go when removal is necessary. And in Minnesota, we also have the tribal state agreement. This is an agreement that uh, we went into the Department of Human Services with our 11 tribal nations within the Minnesota border. And this really is an agreement about how child welfare practices um, are enacted, how they're implemented, how they work with tribes, how they need to reach out and you know support tribes. If a child is under tribal court jurisdiction, what is the responsibility of that county agency and supporting that tribe, our tribe and the family when they're under tribal court jurisdiction? Those kinds of pieces, like who pays for what? Um, so really strengthening ICWA and MIFPA. Next slide, please. So in ICWA, there is a portion of the federal law that mentions active efforts need to be provided to a family in terms of reunification. What does that look like? And in ICWA, it's very broad and MIFPA really defines that. So it's around services, how an agency works with um, setting up um, like appointments for a family, you know, um, rides, reasonable efforts here in Minnesota is considered here's, here's a voucher for, you know, a bus uh, ride so you can make it to your appointment, whereas active efforts really looks at how can I give, get you to your appointment? Do you need me to go with you? Do I need to maybe stay here with the kids and watch the kids while you go? That's active efforts versus reasonable efforts. Really keeping the, the family unit together or really working to reunify the family. Great, thank you, Rihanna. 
So um, this next part, we really wanted to give you all some, maybe some ideas on uh, what you might be able to do from your area of the world to help support American Indian children and families. Um, I think we have uh, stated, you know, that history matters, particularly amongst uh, the tribal nations. And this is a history not often talked about. You're not gonna find this in your academic uh, books. You're not gonna find this on popular media. Um, and so it's going to take some digging, but to educate yourself and understand the historical context, um, it's critical in working with families, children, and children and communities. Um, understanding that the children you work with have a unique political status. They're a citizen of the United States, and they're a citizen of a tribal nation. Um, and so uh, you know, they, they have rights within their tribal nation. Um, and, you know, again, political status, that's what the Indian Child Welfare Act is based on, is that unique political status. Also understanding that each tribal community is distinct. We have 11 tribal nations in Minnesota. Seven, seven of them are Anishinaabe, four are Dakota, each of them very distinct in language, beliefs, uh, maybe how their uh, government entities uh, look, um, all of that. So I think and we have to have that understanding that each community is very distinct. Some similarities, but also some real distinct differences. Also understanding that perhaps the young people you're working with or the organizations that serve those young people, understanding that our American, children, American Indian children especially if they're part of CPS, they're, they're, they live in multiple worlds. Um, they live in, you know, the, the Western world um, while also being American Indian. Maybe they're an urban American Indian. So they, they have this urban world that they're part of, a community perhaps, as well as their home tribal communities. And to take that one step further, sometimes children are part of multiple tribal nations. So they may have multiple um, relationships with their, their homelands and with their home communities. Also, uh, when Rihanna and I were talking about this, about like what would be some good takeaways uh, for, in particular for people that are from early childhood, is to recognize your biases. I think in every, you know, every system, it's important to know this. What are your biases? What do you bring to the table? What's your understanding of American Indians? What's your understanding of poverty? Um, and then how do you portray our families to the different systems? Child protection. You have to make a child protection report. How are you portraying that family? And is anything maybe based on your own bias? You know, think of, so just some things to think about. And then the other thing is uh, we really encourage you all to be learning about tribal approaches to uh, child welfare and prevention. I mentioned earlier uh, some of some of the greatest things happening here in Minnesota related to Indian child welfare is uh, programs that are developed and implemented by tribal nations. Their methods of prevention, how to support families from the front end, so that hopefully you can keep them out of that system. Um, uh, you know, prevention programming, um, the way they do their child welfare, the way they do their child welfare programming, child protection programming. Um, the way they interact with their families. What do they call their families? We have one nation, the Red Lake Nation in our state right now who refers to their clients as relatives. That's a new way of looking at things. When, when, you're, when you're sitting across the table from a relative, there's a certain amount of dignity and respect that you're treating that person with. So that's just you know, one example of, of how tribal nations and, and Indian people are doing things differently. Um, so with that, um, I think we're gonna wrap our part up. Again, this was just a few minutes with you. We only touched on some of the major points. Please do your own learning. We do have some resources we have um, recommended be put into uh, the website for your further learning. Miigwech. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, Rihanna. <clears throat> um, you have you put a lot of uh, food for thought out here for us, and uh, be assured that the resources that you sent us, uh, everybody who's here listening, you can go to the website and you can um, find those resources and learn more. Um, 
So next, we're going to go to um, Renee Boothroyd. Renee, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. All right. Um, thanks again, um, the presenters that came before me just for sharing such, gosh, respectful and important and critical information about this work together and how it really is about people and how we can really focus not only on the outcomes for children and families, but also on what the process is then for getting there. And that also involves partnerships with systems and, and communities and tribes. Um, I'm switching gears just a little bit to focus more on the system level of this work because in my work in implementation, um, we're often reminded that the responsibility for change doesn't rest on the shoulders of those who work directly with children and families. The responsibility for change who's accountable is really those systems, those organizations, those leadership practices that create the kind of environments to host change. So that caseworkers, educators, others working directly with children and families have what they need, have ongoing coaching, are informed by data, are recognized for their contributions. Um, so my comments that I'll share really briefly with you today are really looking at racial justice and child welfare, and in particular, um, how leadership is really leaning into that in California's system through what they call a core practice model or what I'll refer to as the CPM. So they're really trying to confront equity and inclusion as a system um, in terms of leadership's roles and responsibilities, um, looking at the history of institutional and structural racism, and really trying to um, create these systems that can lean in and not necessarily have the answers, right? Because if we had them, they'd be implemented already, but to convene those conversations and to um, continue the kind of partnership and engagement that's so important. So I really just wanted to um, recognize the entire California Core Practice Model Directors Institute and the community tribal partners on, on, on whose behalf I'm speaking. Next slide. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, with humility, provide a couple aims for today. And on the right side are a set of resources that kind of inform and provide way more context than we have time for today. But I wanted to just briefly introduce um, what we mean by the role of leadership in the process of putting evidence into practice, really looking at the organization's role. We have so many leaders that say, well, I'm not working with direct directly with children and families, what's my role in change? And I'm always like, I'm so glad you asked because it's so critical and so important and really helping to unpack and support what that is. Again, using um, the child welfare work in California to illustrate how a set of leadership behaviors can really be powerful antidotes to institutional racism and how we're trying to dig deeper to make connections between the history and even the current context of the systems and how to take these leadership behaviors that are part of their core practice model and really make antidotes to white supremacy culture come to life so that we can see um, the kind of change and you know humbly acknowledge what we're able to do what we're not and work together as a system to keep improving um, and really then just share this call to action across systems to more purposefully attend to this. What you'll see on the right are some implementation resources because my work is really focused on the process of change. The change, the it can be anything, <laughs> a whole bunch of programs, policies and practices, but our work is really focusing on the how. Um, and then I just wanted to provide some um, kind of contextual resources more about that core practice model, as well as some of the work of a director's institute that began, I think in 2017 um, that um, this current work is part of. And a lot of what I'm talking about today is anchored in one of our implementeer newsletters that we created in collaboration with our California colleagues to really lift up this critical role of leadership. Next slide. So I really just wanted to reiterate, this is a, a simple way of thinking about implementation math and that this is a process, right? Oftentimes we think about the strategies on the left and the outcomes on the right. We're anchored in what we want to accomplish and there's usually some kind of it we're focusing on. Well, we know that it by itself doesn't get us to change. It is part of 
those who deliver it, the people who deliver it, it's part of systems that don't or, or do use data or sometimes use data in a negative way. It's part of partnership and engagement practices. So this is really where leadership and the organization fits um, in, in this focus on the how. The process of change is about really strengthening those capacities which as a field, we know what those are and leadership and organizational readiness are one of those really important things that we focus on in implementation. Next slide. Um, so I just really wanted to anchor this in a little bit of science if folks are interested. Um, on the far right, you can see how we are focused on improved outcomes for children and families. And for a while now in this work, we've, we've begun to really know that fidelity to whatever the it is, putting it in place as intended helps us get to those outcomes. But the question has often been, how do we get to fidelity? What do we focus on in order to effectively support the use of evidence and practice? And in my work, we're able to measure those capacities. We're able to measure things like workforce development systems, um, getting data and using data systems, partnership and engagement systems. In other words, how organizations are behaving to create those host environment for change. And what we discovered um, in the reference here um, that's related to a triple P, um, it's a system of positive parenting interventions and some implementation evaluation that we did is if we pull those leadership capacities out, they are actually predict the change in capacities that are also listed there, which leads to fidelity, which leads to outcomes. So there's a huge, there needs to be more of an emphasis on the organizational behaviors and capacities that create the kind of environment to host change. Because we can train people till the cows come home, but if their supervisors don't support it, if what's in the training is in conflict with a visitation process, or a partnership value, a cultural partnership value on how something is approached, then training is not gonna get us what we need. It's, it's, it's important, but it's insufficient. So our work is often about that emphasis on that organizational piece. Next slide. And I just wanted to kind of give a visual of that as well. So you can see in the blue that oftentimes, at least in child welfare language, it's workers and supervisors that are working more directly with children and families. But that work exists in an organizational climate of change, which has to do with like, what's my role? Am I supported in my role? Am I getting feedback about what I'm doing well, what I'm not doing, what I could develop better? How can I develop, grow and learn? Um, I could talk about this for days because we have some great examples of working with native communities in Humboldt County in California. Um, but one of the biggest contributors to that organizational climate is leadership. And in fact, it's often, um, not attended to or minimized. The lack of attention to that organizational behavior is often the major gap in the process of implementation. So we can document training happened. We might even document that data was collected, but we're not necessarily paying attention to and helping to nurture leadership's role in those resources and pathways for change. Um, and here is just listed a few of those bullets about um, what could, can leadership's role be in that? And I have some other great resources I'd love to share if you're interested. Next slide. So um, those resources that were on the aims and context page um, provide a lot more information about this core practice model. And you might ask, you know, kind of what is that? Um, California recognized if they really wanted to address not only their zero to five um, disparities, but also just disparities across the system, that it wasn't about throwing the next evidence-based program um, into the system because the system's broken. And so they really wanted to focus on how do we as an organization practice differently so that no matter what evidence-based strategy we put into play, we're setting it up for success. So what is in the middle here reminds us that there are some practice behaviors that are those family level practice behaviors. I forget the number, um, but there's about, I don't know, I'll say 15 um, practice behaviors across that are kind of bundled in a set of elements that are listed here. Um, and those can be used for training and coaching and gathering feedback and sharing it back with folks to really help them understand what does it mean to lean into culture? What does it mean to lean into trauma and not cause additional trauma for families? So we have that family level practice understanding and set of behaviors, but those by themselves 
aren't enough. Again, because because these these levels of leaders that are working directly with children and families exist within a bigger system. And so I think one of the smartest things California Child Welfare did, and this is all based on in, in partnership and engagement with community over many layers to come up with these, was they defined a set of leadership behaviors as well. And have even refined those down to executive leadership, managers, supervisors. Now those leadership behaviors are organized in the exact same themes as the practice behaviors, but the beauty of them are half of them are about leaders modeling the same family level behaviors we're asking in terms of interactions with children and families. The other half of them are really in reference to what does it take to create a system and an organization? How can we behave as an organization to really help to ensure change? And so those really build on what's in this kind of blue piece around using data and organizational readiness and workforce development. So that's the quick and dirty, if you will, of what is this practice behavior, practice model. Next step, I mean, next slide. Um, I just wanted to share with you a few tidbits about um, how right now, um, given the context that other presenters have shared um, through the Directors Institute, we are really trying to assist the child welfare leadership across counties and with state partnerships and really leaning in to racial justice in the child welfare system. So they've designed, and we know this is insufficient, but it's a great first step, a set of um, webinars, especially given COVID, to really delve into, in terms of a series, this idea of um, racial equity in the system. And really, this is a quote from the folks that were that informed this development was, you know, now is the time to work together as leadership to dismantle, to understand first and dismantle the dominant and oppressive culture characteristics that exist in the system. So, so far there's been um, informational and action sessions, at least two each um, focused on um, African-American partnerships and populations, Native American, and we're kind of stepping into the Latin X ones that are being planned right now. Next slide. Um, and I just wanted to anchor, and I'm so glad that folks were talking about the history, that we can't move forward until we understand. And not that we can wait till we understand, but sometimes we need to create a foundation of understanding. I'm a white privileged person. I don't understand the context of Native communities and Native populations in this country. Um, and I'm learning um, and becoming a partner in that learning process. So this, this institute, especially addressing race equity and inclusion, has been a journey um, where the first initial focus has been really awakening the need for this to be explicit in our core practice model and understanding the history of oppression that's in these systems and knowing what we can do then to dismantle oppression. And that's in particular is the connections to these leadership behaviors. And then what we're going to be doing towards the end of this year after this series is try to take our learning and begin to um, more so clarify to revisit and ensure that those REI principles, those examples, um, those specific characteristics really are screaming loud in these behaviors and principles of this core practice model, because the feedback was it's too embedded. It's, it's not explicit enough to really understand what, say, like addressing inclusion or um, communication could really look like with children and families. Next slide. Um, so this is just one example, a sample strategy in, I think, the second webinar where we were looking at African-American disparities across the system and really trying to map what we were learning about white supremacy culture characteristics, which a lot of those, I'll just be honest, were, were more new to me and made so much sense. Um, but what we've done is begin to link those to the thematic elements of the core practice model, which are kind of vertical teaming and engagement in this example. And taking those leadership behaviors that um, have been um, under development in terms of nurturing them in people um, and making clear a connection to how they can use those as an antidote to address structural and organizational racism in their systems. Um, and so this is just one example of what that has looked like that we'll be building on, hopefully to create a coaching system for child welfare leaders. Next slide, I think this is just my wrap up, yep is just really looking to the idea of um, a call to action for leadership at multiple levels. And I don't mean this by um, title. 
this or position. Leadership exists at multiple levels of communities and organization. Um, and so this call to action is really about um, leading with understanding, sharing that foundational knowledge of racial injustice at organization and system, system levels and really monitoring and using data that's disaggregated by race and ethnicity in an ongoing manner. And what partners with that is building the resources and abilities of people to be able to do that. How do we you know, make data reports more manageable um, where um, they're usable? Um, how do we encourage those kind of conversations? Um, engaging with youth and families and agencies and other system partners to really incorporate those perspectives and those feedback into next steps, not just programs, but next steps in the process. And finally, connecting leaders at multiple levels on a regular basis for this ongoing networking and learning. We're not gonna fix this unless, we're not gonna fix it in a time period. We need to change how we're interacting in the processes of organizations so we're addressing it long-term. Thank you so much for your time today. Renee, thank you so much. That was so fascinating. I have a bunch of questions. I'm sure everyone does. Um, uh, I, you know, leadership counts. Leadership counts all the time, uh, everywhere, is what I always say. And so um, I wanted to just give, and I'm sure that if, you know, I have all these questions that arose uh, for me, um, that the other presenters on the panel have also questions that might have arisen uh, when you were listening to your fellow panelists or comments or aha moments or places where you identified or uh, anything that you might want to say to another one of your panelists at this point uh, before I get into the questions from the um, you know from the participants because we do have also a lot of those but I wanted to give our panelists a chance to kind of um, talk to each other just for uh, a few minutes about anything that you may want to um, speak to um, uh, that your other fellow panelists had to say. Anybody can go, but just remember to take yourself off mute. <laughs> well, I think one of the things for me, it's not, a, it's not a question so much, but I do appreciate the conversation that, or the, the content that's been presented it raised a lot of issues for me in terms of the need for there to be these kinds of experiences, not just where people, where people are both learning more about others, but where there's actually conversation about that learning that I think um, is really essential. That's one thought. And so it was very helpful to listen to Yvonne and Rihanna uh, talk about um, both the policies and the laws that have been practiced that have been developed, um, but also the, the, the critical importance of understanding how, the impact of those on uh, Native American communities and children and families. And there are so many parallels I was thinking of as they were talking about African American families and children and how certain kinds of laws and policies have really disproportionately uh, contributed to damaging uh, African-American family cohesion um, in, the, in the way that I think it has done also in terms of Native American families. So that's, I think, a powerful takeaway for me from this. And then I appreciated Renee's comments about the importance of leadership. I've spent a lot of time thinking about leadership and working with people around racial equity and leadership in early childhood systems. Uh, so I really appreciated hearing about California's model. So those, uh, those, it, those aren't questions, they're just statements of appreciation to my panel, fellow panelists. Oh, that's great. I, I appreciate that too. And they don't have to be questions, any um, ideas that were sparked by your fellow, uh, fellow panelists. Renee, I see you put something in the chat, but do you wanna just go on and um, mention what yeah. you're talking about? <clears throat> I was just gonna, I put in the chat something that's newer um, in terms of my understanding of some reform in child welfare right now. It's a national partnership involving Annie E. Casey and Prevent Child Abuse Neglect America and several others that are really trying to redesign child welfare 
um, into more of a child and family well-being system. And so I think that that will carry into more of these webinars about cross-system collaboration and prevention. Um, and so there's some, some exciting things. Um, and the, the latest report, I think, just illustrated how there's a round two of additional states that have been involved in that. So it'll be really interesting. Yes, it is. And, and hopefully we'll be able to bring some of that information uh, to everybody later in the in the series, um, because there is, you know, there is a lot that's going on and, and uh, we want to be able to bring as much as we can to everybody about this conversation. Um, I just also want to ask a question that was prompted by um, Rihanna, uh, something you put in, in the chat to the panelists, which was about mandated reporters. Um, this is a place where I think is a real on the ground, uh, person to person place where the early childhood and child welfare systems um, actually encounter each other, right? Because folks working in the early childhood system are mandated reporters. <laughs> and, uh, and so what do we need to know? What can those of us who are in the child welfare, uh, in early childhood, in childcare, in pre-K, um, home visitors, early interventionists, all of us, um, what can we do um, to, to make the, to the relationship better when we are mandated reporters? What can we do um, inside ourselves? in order to um, you know, make sure that when we are acting as mandated reporters, we're not bringing our biases to that. But Rihanna, you had something to say about that, would you? Yeah, I think it goes, it stems back to what Yvonne said, knowing your biases and learning a culture, learning the culture of the family, um, learning, um, you know, in our community, our Dakota community, we have family members who are designated to do different things in the family. And so the children will often, you know, be with different relatives at different times throughout the year. And sometimes in early childhood, they may miss a day of school or, um, you know, when a, a funeral happens in our community, the whole community shuts down and we, nobody goes anywhere and we go into like four days of mourning. And so I think knowing those cultural differences and knowing that, well, they're just not, just not showing up. It's because, you know, there's, there may be some cultural things going on within the home and just learning those and learning your families and learning how they do business in their home differently than the mainstream community. And I would just comment too, I think in some of the, the, the informational and kind of reflection work that's going on with some of this California REI and their core practice model is, um, is immediately pairing, maybe sharing the history, some of the timelines and the policies. Like I knew only about the GI Bill from my dad who benefited and not everything that it did in awful ways to other communities in the country. Um, but really pairing those opportunities for understanding and awareness with um, peer reflection time. So we as maybe support staff step out and just encourage you know, through breakout rooms or whatnot, the child welfare directors kind of exploring, what does this look like right now for us? And, and directors have had some similar conversations about the hotlines kind of on the front end and, and their reflections on um, how calls get processes differently when there's an inference that you're talking with a native community or an African-American community or a Latinx family. And, and just giving them safe space to have that humility to say, this is what it looks like. And we don't get enough time for this kind of re reflection. So that's just been, I think, one thing that's been working there too. Absolutely. And the early childhood community is all about reflective practice. <laughs> we, we're, you know, and so I, I just want to point out that we have something to contribute here uh, as a community from our practice to other practices. Um, we have some questions uh, that came up about how do we support foster parents and child care staff um, um, in trauma work and in, informed practice? How do we support um, early childhood practitioners um, doing their work when children who have been abused and neglected um, present with trauma symptoms? Um, there they are, they're in their pre-K class, uh, they're in their child care center, they're behaving differently. 
if you don't know about trauma, you might not know what you're looking at. And then you're going to respond really differently, right? And you might be responding in a way that's not all that helpful. So how can we be more supportive and helpful um, and knowledgeable um, in supporting children who may have been abused and neglected and are, um, have been brought to the attention of the system or even are in foster care? I don't know who wants to go for that. I don't know, maybe Aisha, can I put you on the spot for that one? We have a commonality of workforce challenges, I think is one of the things that you say. I need to, you need to come off mute. You're still on mute, there you go. I, I, I think what you're raising is such a, such a challenge. I mean, there, um, I mean, not to dwell on, you know, o o dwell over overly much on the inadequacies, but many, we have this dynamic in early childhood, early care and learning where we've relied on a workforce of low-income women who are living in communities of scarcity, who themselves have experienced some of them both personal trauma and intergenerational trauma, for instance, as black women. And they themselves need, often need support to address their own particular healing in order to be effective working with families who are experiencing similar kinds of both individual and historic trauma. So, we don't have currently the capacity, a, a significant amount of capacity in these systems to really address these issues for our own workforce in effective ways. There's not the kind of counseling, there's not peer support, there's not um, supervision support. That's, that's across the system in a way that is helpful. And if in my own experience, talking with people who are in the workforce and at the you know, point of delivery of service, they themselves often express anger towards families who they see as um, not doing what they feel they should be doing for their children, or they feel great sympathy for families who are not doing what they're able to do for their children. And it's a com complex set of responses, but I don't think we yet have put in place, or really thought through in, particularly in the early care and learning end of things. We have trauma-informed care. We have support to some extent for, for staff who are um, in training around those issues, but it's, I don't, in my experience, it's not broad enough and deep enough to really help many of the staff that are, in childcare programs that are doing family, friend, and neighbor care, where the majority of Black children sit. I mean, those, those systems serve those children. Those are the real places in which Black kids are. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I'm really just saying, I think this is a, it's, there's no easy solution to this because of the capacity issues. And, and, uh, and I think the biases that Yvonne spoke of, I mean, I think the, the, the attitudes, the biases towards black families are so deep and so pervasive in early childhood, the sense that black people cannot be trusted to raise, we cannot be trusted to raise our own children is a, is in, in, again, in my experience in the field, it's a profound belief that people that often undergirds a lot of engagement with families and makes this whole, issue of being sensitive to intergenerational trauma or even personal trauma, hard for people to reach. Absolutely. And somebody just put in the chat, we need uh, trauma um, supports available to ECE workforce um, as well. Yeah. So I think, that, yeah. I think the message is that we, um, we have a lot yet to be done to support both mm -hmm. workforces and in, in what their own needs are and in um, their ability to come together and build right. relationships and, uh, in order to do the work together. Um, we have a question from somebody, um, Yvonne, I'll throw this one to you, is what's the best way to become familiar uh, with tribal approaches to child welfare? Sure, that's a great question. Um, 
I would recommend um, just one way of doing that is uh, uh, several states have um, tribal liaisons that work for their Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and these are often folks that have uh, experience on the community level um, with a number of different issues um, and have a track record of working with tribal nations uh, and knowing how to form uh, effective relationships with tribes. So one way is to seek out uh, the DHS in your state and connect with the tribal liaison. In our state, we're fortunate to have tribal liaisons in child welfare as well as early childhood. There's a, there's a organization called MINTREK, and I'm gonna forget how to, how to say it, but essentially it's tribally based um, early learning programs. And we have a liaison at the state that works with them. Anyway, that's one way to do it. Um, also just doing some learning on your own, reading, you know, um, uh, going to community events. I often tell folks, if you're interested in what's happening at community, go to some community events. We have many that are open to the public. Um, you know, um, it, it's often helpful if you know someone from that community to try to, you know, tag along and, and get some interpretation of what's happening. Um, but there's so many good things happening all across Indian country in relation to um, child welfare, early childhood, um, you know, if you have some early childhood programs that you know exist in the community, do some outreach. In my particular community here uh, in Minnesota, we have uh, an American Indian Montessori based program and very fortunate to have that. Um, one of the ways that they are uh, helping to prevent um, um, interaction with different systems is they have social work staff on, you know, on their uh, organizational chart, if you will, in their circle, you know, people that can make connections with families can that know the community based resources, they know housing resources, they know where to refer families that might have a financial need. Um, so it's just another example of, of how things are happening in that early childhood realm too. Great. Thank you, Yvonne. And uh, Renee, I have a question for you relative to, well, here's the question. Um, <laughs> in child welfare, caseworkers tend to have mixed caseloads. They, could, they can have babies and they can have 17 and 18 year olds, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so when, they, when, when core practice models are developed, they're not necessarily developmentally informed. So how can, Aisha is smiling because I talk about this all the time and I'm, now I'm gonna take advantage of having you here, Renee, who's working on, <laughs> on a core practice model to say, how can early childhood um, partner more closely with child welfare agencies to make their core practice models more developmentally informed? So that they know there's a difference between dealing with a family that's got a baby and a 17 year old that's been in residential treatment for five years. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, I, I, I wasn't involved at the very beginning when California's core practice model was being developed. But I know that some other states like New Jersey also have one in child welfare that had been used. Um, my sense right now, especially when I think from an implementation perspective, is really looking at data. So, for example, um, one county that was really looking at disproportionality and disparities through looking at their data really began to see that zero to five disparity scream loud and more loud and more clear than the other disparities when they maybe they looked at other populations, whether that was by age or, or um, other kinds of aspects. So what they then began doing was almost doing a almost like a, a but why technique. So why is this happening? And exploring then the things that contribute um, to that. And to me, that would be a really good, not only a good way of looking at, so what's the lever of change, but also how to take that kind of approach from an early childhood perspective and make it more clear in these behaviors. So if the behaviors are really what's operationalizing the practice model, what has been helpful in taking that further is 
um, you know, exploring, if I were to show up at an organization, how would I see teaming? And, and how might that look different for maybe a tribal community interaction um, may, and maybe um, a situation where an infant has been involved. So taking that kind of race ethnicity approach in terms of disparities, but also an age issue or developmental issue in that as well, um, and really helping staff in the organization see where does what does this look like now um, and what could it look like if we were, were to address it differently and I've been amazed at the kind of ideas that come from just having that kind of conversation and really um, it's like an adaptive leadership giving the work back to the people that's where the innovations and ideas are going to come and we can use data as systems better to have those kinds of conversations and really get that wisdom from a variety of perspectives whether that's rei work early childhood other kinds of vantage points thank you for that thank you very much looks like people in the chat are appreciating your response to that as well um, I'm just going to um, get two more questions in here quickly. Um, one question was, um, are there programs for parents uh, where parents can get coaching um, a, around um, their own uh, need to understand very young children around um, um, child abuse and neglect, various topics, but the program, what the question was, where can parents go to get their own coaching? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that um, you know one of the one of the things that we're all probably while we're all sitting here contemplating is because there isn't a single answer. There might be something in. Uh, I think probably we would recommend that you start in your community and start with um, your um, maybe your local providers of, of uh, children and family services, not necessarily your state department, but <laughs> your local providers of. Uh, uh, of support services for children and for families and find out what's going on there. I'm not, you know, we, there, there's a lot and, uh, but it's locally based, I think, to, as a best way to start. I think there's always a balance too, right? We have so many urgent and serious and, and, um, um, big needs for things like that at, right now in terms of direct service. But none of that is going to change to be maintained unless we're also helping systems really look at, let's presume that, let, let's put those kind of expectations for ongoing coaching or some trauma-informed um, coach, you know, peer networking um, into some of our applications for foster parents or other kinds of um, parent support partners that work in our system. Let's create incentives and ways to support um, putting that expectation into practice so that it's a shared sense of accountability for the outcomes that we want, not necessarily just an accountability of me being a foster parent, um, that systems need to be embracing these same kinds, this, these, this same sense of what are the needs, why do we have them, and what can we do about it, instead of just saying, let's throw training at it, which often happens, and it's too isolated um, and too... Um, not lasting for change. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And people are putting in the chat uh, any number of different options. Circle of Security has come up multiple times. We know there's Triple P out there. Um, there are any number of um, evidence-based programs as these are um, that are available um, across the country. So we had a question, where is this conversation leading to? <laughs> The person said, uh, are we going to, for policy change or is this just a conversation? I love that question. Um, and so our intention with this series is to, first of all, for the um, folks who are working in both uh, arenas to understand the other arena better. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think that when Rihanna and Yvonne um, talked, it, made, it, was, it became really very clear that, um, that this is all relational, right? It's relational when we are on the front lines, it's relational when we talk about our workforce, and it's relational when we talk about leadership. And so what we wanted to do is, is to uh, create a table where we can begin to um, listen and understand and learn. Um, after that, 
um, our intention really is to, um, and we're going to do some more concrete things in the seat in the sessions that follow, but is to share uh, experiences from different states with what they're actually doing that's working on the ground to uh, support this kind of a collaboration. Whether or not these things lead to policy change, I think is a question a little further down the road, but what we do want it to do is that we want, to, want it to lead to practice change and we want it to lead to operational change. Um, and so this is why we, it, it's such a great thing that we were able to start off with this kickoff and you can get some understanding of the why, um, you can get some understanding of uh, disparities that are so driving um, both of these two systems simultaneously and some understanding of leadership and how we need to lead for systems change. Um, and so thank you for that question. We have five minutes and I would um, like to just throw it back to the panelists for each of you to just um, take a minute with any final thoughts that you would like to share with our participants. And don't be shy. <laughs> never, never shy to talk. Um, and this is actually something that I learned through amazing partnership work um, with this California child welfare stuff over the last 10 years. Partnership is critical. And I mean partnership, not I don't even mean with systems, I mean with with parents, with with tribes, with um, parent partners and programs. Um, the thing that I learned the most was if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. Awesome. Yes. Thank you for that. I would just echo a little bit about what Renee just said. Um, I think that we need to create the space to learn from the experts. Um, I'm not that expert. Uh, the, fan, the moms and dads um, and children that have lived um, live this are the experts and so we need to lift them up and, and create safe um, meaningful places for them to help us understand what works for them absolutely you know, thank I, mean, you. I, I i think the, the the really absent piece in all of this is you know you can have um people like ourselves who have experience and maybe some knowledge and whatever to share and everyone who came to this meeting is also in that same you know, population of people who are thinking about these issues and signing up for this kind of webinar and so on and so forth. But I think the really, the missing element is uh, communities and families at, at the point of service and, and who are living, in com and living really in communities that are in many, many cases desperate. And these, entities like early childhood education and child welfare often are helping them, but not always and not sufficiently and not consistently. And I think we need to understand a hell of a lot more about that lived experience and what those systems need to be in order to serve them effectively. The problem of being caught between federal and state and county and city mandates and communities is a real tough place to sit. But I think if we don't bring those voices consistently, uh, those perspectives consistently, uh, that wisdom that exists there into all of these kinds of discussions, um, we really are simply spinning the wheels again in, a, in many, many ways. We're reforming, reforming and tinkering rather than overhauling and completely changing for the better because their voices have almost consistently not been present. Even when we think we have parent advisory committees, they're not determining what, for instance, the early childhood curriculum needs to be or what the teaching standards in the state of Illinois should be or Minnesota or California or wherever. Yeah. Uh, there's some degree of that kind of participation, but it doesn't actually change significantly the system. And when you look at higher education, where many of the people who work in these two systems are, are trained and prepared, those inputs from those communities are not in higher education by and large. So there's, there's a lot of, I think, exclusion 
that we need to, to really correct in the work that we're doing. Excellent point. Thank you, Aisha. Brianna, you want to have the last word? Yeah, I'm just going to leave a statement, and this is usually what Yvonne says. And so um, equity is not whether everyone has shoes, but whether everyone has shoes that fit. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Perfect. Nothing else to be said. I want to thank all the panelists. You were fantastic. I want to thank all of the participants for joining us, for participating through the chat, um, for your interest. We really appreciate it. We hope that you will continue with us. Our next session is February the 16th. Thank you, everyone. And there's and there's a pop-up uh, form that- Oh, the evaluation. Thing. Right. Thank you. You're yes, welcome. we have an evaluation. Please fill out our form, our evaluation questions. Thank you, Aisha.